So before we start um, the defense itself, I would like to remind you about the procedure. So first I will myself start with the introduction of the jury and of the candidate. And uh, this will be followed by the candidate's presentation up to 40 minutes. When the presentation is done, this will be followed by questions from the jury first. And after answers, uh, satisfactory answers to the jury, each member has to confirm that they are satisfied uh, or not with the changes introduced to the thesis after the review. Then, if uh, in the audience, uh, colleagues here and online would like to ask questions to the candidate, I will give them an opportunity to do so after which we will have uh, a word from the supervisor, in, in this case, supervisors. Um, after uh, the supervisors give their thoughts, then we'll have the uh, closed deliberation. So I will uh, ask everybody except the jury members to, to stay in this room. And for those uh, colleagues online who are with us, uh, they will be in the breakout, breakout room. So we will have uh, a vote. And after we make a decision, after the deliberation, we'll invite the candidate and uh, other guests uh, for the announcement of the outcome uh, for the candidate. So now uh, I will start with a um, presentation of the jury gathered today for uh, the defense uh, of the PhD entitled Nanoscale Phase Separation and Transformations in the Silicon Oxygen and Related System by Mr. Uh, Patrick Agri. And um, our jury members are as follows. Dr. Maria Candila from the National Hellenic Research Foundation. So Dr. Maria Candila received her diploma in electrical, uh, in electrical in, uh, and computer engineering from the National Technical University of Athens in Greece in 2000 and her master's and PhD in applied physics from Harvard University in 2002 and 2006. She uh, then worked as postdoctoral uh, associate at the, at the MIT from 2006 to 2008 as an EU Marie Curie and, and then as a uh, EU Marie Curie fellow at the National Technical University of Athens, Greece from 2008 to 2010. Since 2010, Dr. Maria Candila has been working at the National Hellenic Research Foundation as research staff. The focus of her research is on the interaction of laser radiation with matter, including thermal and non-thermal ultra-fast phase transitions, laser nanostructuring, optoelectronics, and photonics. She has 20 years of experience in laser matter interaction and numerous scientific contributions in, uh, in terms of publications, conference presentations, and research grants in this field. Professor Dong Liu from uh, University of Science and Technology of China. So he's currently a tenure track research professor of chemistry at the USTC. He obtained his bachelor's degree and PhD degrees from the USTC in 2012 and 2017 under the supervision of Professor uh, Xiong Yu Jin. After graduating, he went to Nanyang Technological University in Singapore to conduct postdoctoral research supervised by Prof. Liu Bin and Prof. Shui Kan. He joined the Suzhou Institute for Advanced Research and School of Chemistry and Material Science at the USTC in May 2021. So far, Dr. Liu has published more than 30 papers in leading academic journals, including Chemical Reviews, Nature Communication, and Gevante Chemi International Editions, and so on. And he currently serves as youth editorial mem board member of the Chinese Chemical Letters since 2022 and youth editor of the International Journal of Extreme Manufacturing. Here at Skoltech, our colleague Professor Dmitry Aksionov so started his research at Belgorod State University in 2008, studying grain boundary segregation of carbon nitrogen, oxygen, and iron impurities and precipitation of titanium carbide phases in HCP titanium using DFT methods. In 2014, he defended his candidate of science degree in physics and mathematics. And in 2013 and 2014, he worked at the Max Planck Institute 
for ion research in Dusseldorf with, um, uh, I, I would say, Professor Hickel and Professor Nug Bauer. In 2016, uh, Dmitry got a position of uh, research scientist at Skoltech, where he started to study new inorganic materials for cathodes of secondary metal ion batteries using computational methods. In collaboration with his colleagues, Professor Dmitry Aksionov helped to leverage complex structure property relationships in newly developed battery materials, paving the path for the improvement and successful, successful commercialization. Professor uh, Aksionov currently leads the Computational Materials Group studying materials for the next generation metal, metal ion batteries in tight collaboration with experimentalists. The group focuses on the inve investigation of electrode electrolyte interfaces in metal ion batteries, including design of highly stable interfaces with low ionic resistivity. So the group leverages a high thro throughput approach in materials modeling and develops the software CMAN for automization of calculations. Our other um, Skoltech jury member, Professor Sakelis Mailis, he graduated from the physics department at the University of Crete in Greece. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Crete and Foundation for Research and Technology, Hellas, in 1996. In 1998, he joined the Optoelectronics Research Center at Southampton in the UK as a postdoctoral fellow to investigate laser-induced optical and structural modifications in ferroelectric crystals and other photonics materials. Professor Miley's became a senior research fellow in 2000 and principal research fellow in 2008. He joined the hybrid photonics lab at Skoltech in 2019 where he's conducting research on the development of optical waveguide circuits in photonics materials and the growth of 2D semiconductors. So today with us, um, we have also Professor Piotr Prichotchenko, uh, Prichotchenko uh, from the uh, Kornakov Institute. So Professor Prichotchenko obtained his PhD from the Kornakov Institute of General and Inorganic Chemistry in Russia. He worked as a senior researcher at the Laboratory of Oxidants at the Kornatov Institute, and which is a part of the uh, Russian Academy of Science between 2004 and 2015. And he current, currently um, is the head of this laboratory. Between 2005 and uh, 2020, Dr. Prichotchenko served as a visiting researcher as, at the Library of Environmental Chemistry the Kassali Institute of Applied Chemistry, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Nanyang Technological University. His research interests include colloidal chemistry, advanced materials, nanomaterials, sol gel chemistry, thin films, coatings, inorganic chemistry, hydrogen peroxide, perox peroxo compounds, nanocrystals, P-block elements, and uh, many other um, systems and materials. So today I'm the uh, chair of this uh, PhD jury. Um, so quickly, I graduated with an MS in statistical physics from Université de Sergi Pontoise in France in 1997, and uh, with a PhD in physics from Harriot Watt University in the UK in 20, uh, in, sorry, in uh, 2002. I also hold, uh, hold uh, master of, masters of art in European project management from uh, University of uh, De Caen. Normandy, France. So before joining Skoltech, um, I worked in different research institutes in Glasgow University, Tyndall National uh, Institute in Ireland, CNRS Laboratories in France, and the Russian Quantum Center here in Moscow. So my research activities span uh, different fields of physics and engineering, including solid state physics, atomic and molecular physics, non-equilibrium non -equilibrium thermodynamics, <laughs> physical chemistry and biophysics. I joined Skoltech as a leading research scientist in 2017 to work on the project funded by the next generation Skoltech MIT program. I am currently uh, an associate professor at Skoltech, uh, leading the energy conversion physics and technology group. I'm also director of the engineering systems PhD program and chair of the educational committee here at Skoltech. Now I turn to the supervisors. Um, Professor Alexander Korsunski, 
So he's, he received his degree of Doctor of Philosophy from Merton College in Oxford, uh, UK, following his undergraduate edu education in theoretical physics. He currently heads the higher geekly uh, structured materials group in Skoltech. So Professor Alexander Korsunki, Korsunski has given keynote plenaries at major international conferences on engineering and materials. He has developed numerous international links, including visiting professorships at Università Roma 3 in Italy, NCCAN France, where I used to work in the past, and National University of Singapore. Professor Korsunski's research interests concern developing improved understanding of integrity and reliability of engineered and natural structures and systems from high performance metallic allow, allows, alloys to polycrystalline ceramics to natural heart tissue such as human dentin and seashell nacre. Dr. Alexei Salimon is also our colleague at Skoltech and um, until recently, so he was a research, um, a senior research engineer in the field of higher chemically uh, structural materials. So with uh, energy, biomedical and structural applications. He received a candidate of science degree from the Department of Physical Chemistry uh, at MISIS in 1997. And his doctoral thesis was devoted to the investigation of the structural changes in metal powders under high energy mechanical activation and alloying. Dr. Alexei Salimon has more than 20 years of experience in the field of new materials and technologies, nanostructure metals and alloys, quasi-crystalline intermetallics, and this was at the University of Newcastle in the UK from 1997 to 1998, bulk metallic glasses, composites, elastomer resistance to explosion decompression. From um, 2002 to 2004, Dr. Salimon developed the expert system for the finding of applications for new materials under Professor uh, Ashby leadership in uh, Institut National de Physique in uh, Grenoble, France. And since joining Skoltech in 2018, Dr. Salimon has been lecturing the course Materials Selection and Mechanical Design mm -hmm. and assist in lecturing Applied Materials and Design course. Last but not least, our candidate today, Mr. Patrick Agré. So Patrick graduated from the Kwame uh, Nkrumah University of Science and Technology with a major in materials engineering. He later received his master's degree in advanced materials science from the National University of Science and Technology, MISIS. In 2018, Patrick was admitted to the Skoltech PhD program in materials science and engineering and his research work aims at understanding the effects of transformations with the silicon oxygen system on the structure and properties of nanostructured silicon and silica based energy materials and designing cost effective and env environmentally friendly synthesis routes to produce them. Some of his results have uh, already been published. So at present, his main focus of, um, in research is centered on silica and silicon based anode materials obtained from naturally occurring diatom uh, earth for improved performance in batteries. So now that um, presentations and introductions of the jury members and the candidate and PhD advisors um, is done, we can uh, proceed to the uh, candidate's presentation. And if it is ready, you now have up to 40 minutes for your presentation. Please start. Hello. Okay. So, uh, can we have the presentation? Yes, yes, just a second. Let me start it from the very beginning for you. Okay, the control is yours now, Patrick. Good morning, jury chair and members. Good morning, distinguished uh, professors and uh, good morning, colleagues. I'm Patrick Agri, and I'm here to present my PhD thesis titled uh, The Nanoscale Phase Separation and Transformations in the Silicon, Oxygen and Related Systems. And my supervisor is Professor Alexander Kosonsky. 
So in the course of the PhD studies, uh, we managed to publish six um, papers and uh, just before the completion of uh, the PhD studies, we published uh, a book chapter as well. And also as part of the requirements for School Tech PhD, I participated in three conferences. Today's uh, presentation will take this format. Um, I'll first of all talk about uh, the background of the study, uh, which deals with the silicon oxygen particulate and consolidate, and also the problem statement, um, the research objectives, uh, materials processing and characterization, and the results will be split into three parts. So uh, the first part of the results talks about silica and silicon powder characteristics as a function of thermally induced phase transformations. Uh, the second part, which uh, has got to do with in situ formed textured silicon via the magnesiothermic reduction of silica uh, directly on the silicon substrate. And the uh, last part talks about uh, bilayer bi textured silicon and amorphous carbon nanocomposite. And finally, the conclusion. So, the silicon oxygen system is uh, a well known and uh, widely studied uh, system. And materials such as uh, silica, uh, silicon, and um, silicates, silica, and silicon based materials such as silic silicon carbide and magnesium uh, silicide have found widespread applications. Uh, for instance, in the case of silica and silicates, uh, are widely used in the glass industry, uh, and also the metallurgical form of silicon, which is uh, like the backbone of the semiconductor industry and also widely used in uh, photovoltaics. And materials from this system are highly sought after because of the natural abundance, uh, the non-toxicity, uh, its biocompatibility, eco-friendliness, and also the low cost. But quite recently, uh, materials from this system have been considered uh, as potential game changers in the development of uh, high energy density uh, anodes to power the next generation of electric vehicles and also uh, for applications in drug delivery, in environmental protection, and also for improved light matter interaction for optical uh, devices. Uh, other applications include uh, gas sensing, supercapacitors, thermal energy storage. And for these to uh, be made possible, uh, it relies on uh, key properties of, sorry, properties of silicon such as uh, the high high theoretical capacity of silicon and its direct derivatives um, the low refractive index of uh, of um, the low refractive index and multiple scattering of porous silicon and silicon coatings and also uh, the ability of uh, certain silica types to serve as a bio template for um, active materials um, for this to be made possible, uh, it is important to functionalize um, silicon-based materials or materials from the silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen system. And this, these include uh, the kinetic study of um, reduction reactions and also uh, selection of suitable uh, silicious materials for uh, synthesis. Also, it is important to uh, use a number of conventional and non-conventional reduction reactions. Uh, quite a lot of progress have been, uh, has been made uh, recently where uh, people studied uh, the effect of um, nanostructure in the surface of uh, silicon uh, substrate uh, for applications as, uh, as a nanode material for uh, battery applications. And in this case, uh, we can clearly see nanostructured silicon surface, um, which helped to improve the um, anode performance. Also, a similar approach has been used in the creation of silicon nanowires, also for anode uh, applications. And lastly, but uh, the last but not the least, uh, the creation of um, black silicon, which is a nanostructured silicon surface for improved uh, light matter interaction. All these uh, methods uh, have been, all these um, approaches were made through conventional methods of producing nanostructured uh, uh, silicon based materials, uh, mostly via uh, chemical etching uh, routes. So, uh, the problem 
we're trying to solve here is to develop and optimize a controlled and economical means of fabricating nanostructured silicon-based particulates and consolidates. And this will extensively deal with uh, challenges with existing techniques such as the high cost, energy intensive uh, nature of uh, such processes and uh, complex uh, synthesis protocols as well as uh, the issues with scalability and safety concerns. And as such, we were looking for eco-friendly techniques, uh, low uh, techniques that uh, require low cost, uh, low energy consumptions, and also uh, facile, that's easy uh, processes. So the research objectives are as follows. To optimize the synthesis route for the fabrication of uh, nanostructured silicon um, from diatomaceous on uh, silicon substrate, and also to understand the role of silica phase transformations on the kinetics and outcome of silica silicon convention by magnesiothermic reduction reaction, and to use diatom frustal and nanosized silica precursors as a platform for nanostructured materials. And last but not least, uh, to investigate optical, electrochemical, and other energy-related applications of bi and multi-layered nanocomposite structures from these precursors. So uh, the first part of uh, the materials and processing deals with the main material used in this study. And the main silica precursor used for this, used in this study was uh, diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth was used because of uh, the neat, neatly formed nanoporous structure of this uh, siliceous material. And as intended, uh, the aim was to produce uh, nanostructured uh, silicon materials or uh, silicon-based materials with uh, nanoscale morphologies, as can be seen from from here yeah so uh, in order to re retrieve or to synthesize silicon from silica or siliceous materials um, normally uh, carbothermal process is used uh, but in the case of producing nanostructured uh, silicon based materials from silic from diatomaceous earth carbothermal uh, process is not very ideal because of the high temperatures required and the fact that uh, it leads to poor microstructural control and also requires quite high energy, which is something we're trying to avoid. As such, the magnesiothermic reduction reaction becomes um, the more suitable option for us because it, it comes with uh, low uh, temperatures also offers good microstructural control and uh, uh, offers low energy and cost. In terms of the thermodynamics of uh, magnesiothermic reduction reactions, um, the sorry, in terms of the thermodynamics of methylothermic reduction reactions, uh, the magnesiothermic, the aluminothermic, and calciothermic all have uh, negative de delta Gs, which means they are feasible, but uh, only reports of magnesiothermic and aluminothermic have been reported. And as a way to improve the kinetics of these reactions, uh, people have studied the effect of uh, reaction, uh, reactant molar ratio, the reaction temperature, the ramping rate, uh, the uh, effect of heat scavengers to uh, scavenge excess heat, uh, the reaction time, and also powder mixing. Uh, but very little attention has been paid to the form of uh, silica precursors use, and uh, that's uh, an area this study focused on to reduce um, um, different forms of the same silica, uh, silica powder, that's uh, crystalline and amorphous forms of uh, the same diatomaceous earth powder. As such, um, diatomaceous earth, diatom silica powders were heat treated at uh, 1,100 degrees Celsius in air and under the flow of argon. And uh, the pristine, that's as obtained powder and heat treated silica precursors were reduced with magnesium at 600 degrees for six hours. And they were subsequently purified using um, HF, HN, HCl, and deionized water uh, rinsing. So the purified powders were dried at 70 degrees in vacuum overnight and uh, were characterized. The magnesiothermic reduction reaction was also explored for the creation of nanostructured silicon coatings directly on uh, silicon wafer. And 
the first attempt uh, yielded this uh, silicon wafer with clusters of uh, nanostructured silicon uh, coating on top of it directly. And uh, reactions A and B that led to this um, cluster of uh, silicon coatings on top of the wafer have been highlighted here. Uh, proposed, the reaction proposed uh, in path A is just a direct um, reaction between magnesium and silica, which uh, leads to silicon, which um, is directly bonded to the substrate surface. And also in the case of um, reaction part B, we see the same reaction as in A, but also an intermediate phase uh, magnesium silicide is formed, which, uh, which is a reaction between uh, magnesium um, particles and uh, the surface of uh, the silicon substrate and the subsequent reaction of the magnesium, intermediate magnesium silicide phase um, with surrounding silica particles to form uh, silicon. So finally, uh, the silica precursors together with the silicon powder, which is uh, brown, and also the silicon substrate with um, nanostructured surface were characterized uh, using state-of-the-art characterization techniques uh, listed here, such as uh, uh, TGA, DSC, DTA, uh, scanning electron microscopy, uh, XRD, bed porosimeter, uh, Merman spectroscopy, and also particle size analysis. So another extension of the work um, or the protocol used uh, um, involved the use of phase separation. And phase separation typically involves um, two distinct components or materials which coexist um, in one solution at a point and upon um, a drop in temperature. That's when induced by temperature split into two different phases. And this is uh, well known in material science as far as the development of alloys, especially in uh, metallurgy, uh, is concerned. And uh, in uh, explaining phase separation from the phase diagram point of view, we see two phase, a single phase here which splits to two phases when temperature drops. That's typically cooling. So phase separation gives us an opportunity to um, prepare several interesting outcomes. It also it is also environmentally friendly. It comes with a low cost, uh, and doesn't require a lot of energy, and it's a very uh, simple synthesis uh, route. Uh, we explored it for the f um, we explored it uh, for the creation of um, porous anti-reflective uh, uh, carbon coating directly on the textured silicon surface, but um, it is possible to also uh, obtain uh, silica spheres or porous carbonized um, carbon membranes or even polymer membranes from uh, the phase separation technique. But how does it work? It works um, this way. Uh, typically, um, a precursor of uh, silica, in, in this case, uh, Teos, in its solvent, HCl and THF, uh, mixed with, um, in our case, PAN in its solvent, which was DMF, uh, but also other um, polymers can be used, such as PMF and THF. And what we did was we mixed uh, these two solutions and pipetted them directly on our texture silicon wafer surface, which will be uh, discussed further. So uh, another part of this study um, investigated the uh, electrochemical performance of uh, silica and uh, silicon-based materials from uh, diatomaceous earth, and as such, uh, electrodes from these materials were prepared uh, as follows. Uh, slurries were prepared uh, using different compositions for uh, silica and uh, silicon, and these slurries were tape, cost, uh, tape casted on um, a copper foil and subsequently dried, and the electrodes were assembled in uh, argon-filled uh, glove box and tested using the biologic potential stack. So the first part of, of the results, uh, which talks about silica and silicon powder characteristics as a function of uh, thermally induced phase formation. So, uh, pristine silica or aspergillus silica um, has a neatly formed nanoporous uh, structure, but also has impurities which uh, normally block these pores. 
and as part of um, of the objectives of this study to uh, investigate the effect of uh, heat treatment on uh, the powder characteristics and also other uh, powder properties, we heat treated these samples in different environments. One uh, in air, which is the roasted diatom silica, and also uh, the other under the flow of argon. Uh, the difference is just um, a matter of the environment, but uh, both treatments yielded quite different color changes, but the drastic color change was with the roasted uh, diatom silica. Another interesting thing about the um, heat treatment procedure is that it is able to uh, unclog all uh, the pore areas uh, in the pristine powder uh, because during heat treatment uh, a lot of impurities are decomposed and um, XRD analysis also confirmed uh, crystallization of uh, these powders with the main phase as uh, alpha crystallite in, in both roasted and calcined silica. So the effect of uh, heat treatment were further, was further explored and uh, it was interesting for us to uh, understand the effect of um, the environment on the coloration and uh, it, it was obvious that uh, elements of uh, carbon, of sorry, of iron in, in, uh, in elemental form or in an oxide form uh, played a role in um, the coloration effect here because uh, in the case of the roasted um, diatom silica, the reddish color is quite um, uh, typical for hematite, which is um, uh, a type of uh, iron oxide, which is not seen here in the calcined uh, silica powder. Also, the powder, powder character is as a function of heating uh, was, okay, so yeah. Again, um, Raman spectroscopy also confirmed the presence of um, phases such as cristobalite, uh, hematite, and uh, magnetite in the roasted uh, silica, in the roasted uh, silica powder, and the absence of such phases in uh, the calcined silica powder. And uh, thermal analysis of the powders showed uh, for TG analysis, it showed quite same uh, behavior but uh, quite opposite behaviors for uh, the DTA analysis. Also, uh, the powder characteristics uh, of the pristine and heat-treated uh, powders changed uh, slightly after the heat treatment uh, with uh, quite an increase in the particle size distribution. Um, and from um, the Sherry equation, the crystallite size of um, uh, the main phase crystallite in the roasted and calcined uh, powders were obtained. And it was obvious that uh, in the case of the calcined uh, silica precursor, um, a much smaller crystallite size, uh, crystal crystallite crystallite size was obtained. And uh, pore, surface area and pore analysis also revealed that um, pore size increased uh, slightly after heat treatment and uh, surface area decreased after the heat treatment. So again, the characteristics of uh, silicon powders which were synthesized from diatom silica via the magnesiothermic reduction reaction. Uh, the Raman spectra here for the three individual powders uh, confirmed the first order Raman spectra confirmed the presence of uh, silicon um, in both powders and um, also the crystallite size estimation uh, via the Scherer equation uh, confirmed that uh, silicon obtained from uh, the calcine diatom silica had the smallest um, silicon crystallite size. Also, the same trend uh, in the surface and pore size were seen for the obtained silicon uh, powders as in the silica precursors. This part of the study um, focused on the effect of uh, heat treatment on the onset and peak exothermic temperatures of uh, different silica precursors on 
um, the magnesium thermic reduction. And as can be seen here, uh, so this particular measurement was done under uh, two different heating uh, rates, one at five degrees per Kelvin and also the other at 10 degrees per Kelvin. And it was uh, first of a kind because very little, um, I think in, in, in existing literature, not so much work has been done uh, to understand the effect of um, um, the crystal, uh, crystalline structure or amorphous structure on the uh, onset re uh, silica reduction temperature. So um, this, study, this particular result showed that the crystalline uh, silica powders had uh, um, a lower uh, onset reduction temperature than the um, uh, pristine, that's the amorphous uh, silica powders. And also the effect of um, the structure on the electrochemical uh, performance was also explored. Uh, the first part deals with uh, amorphous uh, silica uh, powder, which shows a rather um, slow increase in uh, the capacity with uh, increase in cycle number. And also uh, for the crystalline silica powders, we see a rather um, rapid increase in the, in the uh, specific, specific capacity with increasing uh, cycle number. And the columbic, uh, columbic efficiencies of uh, these uh, electrodes were also, uh, <coughs> sorry, were also uh, calculated. And we can see that for all the electrodes, uh, the amorphous and also for the uh, crystalline electrodes, they all have quite high uh, columbic efficiencies, but uh, the main difference is with the uh, increase in uh, specific capacity, which is more pronounced for the crystalline powders than for the amorphous powder. So the electrochemical performance of recovered silicon-based anodes were also compared with that of bulk silicon. And as can be seen here for bulk silicon, we see a very um, rapid decline in capacity uh, from the 1st to the 10th and also to the 20th. And uh, uh, this is also evident in the columbic efficiency um, chart here where we see this decline in capacity. But in the case of the um, nano silicon powder, we see a, a rather uh, slow decline in, in the specific capacity. And uh, this is also seen here in the columbic efficiency uh, chart here. So a very quick comparison with uh, mainstream analogs uh, shows that um, uh, the calcine powder offers uh, slightly high uh, charge capacity, uh, but uh, ball milled um, diatom derived silica and calcine plus ball milling uh, of uh, diatom derived silica offers uh, much better uh, charge discharge capacity. And in terms of uh, uh, the silicon anode compared with previously reported silica anodes which were produced via um, quite uh, non-environmentally friendly uh, approaches. Uh, the powders produced via magnesiothermic reduction reaction uh, performs quite well compared with these, uh, uh, these results. Okay, so the second part uh, of the result talks about in-situ form textured silicon via magnesiothermic reduction reaction. And the first attempt, like I mentioned earlier, um, yielded uh, silicon wafer uh, substrate with uh, clusters of silicon coating, which was also observed under, my, under same as uh, these clusters. And uh, at high magnification, uh, it, it can be best described as um, a ragged uh, surface with irregular peaks and valleys on like uh, in the case of black silicon, which has quite regular peaks and valleys. Uh, XRD and Raman um, measurements confirm the presence of uh, nano or amorphous uh, crystalline uh, coating formed directly on the wafer. And EDX analysis also confirmed the high purity nature of uh, these coatings. Also to understand the um, doping type of um, an attempt to understand the doping type of 
this uh, nanostructured silicon coating uh, was made using uh, conductivity measurements uh, with uh, EFM where the surface potentials of, um, of the coating were studied and um, uh, we know that surface potential is uh, related to the work function of, um, of uh, semiconductors and uh, this is quite different for N-type and P-type semiconductors. So uh, our findings from this was that uh, the most likely uh, conductivity type of uh, the nanostructured silicon coating was uh, N-type and uh, uh, the conductivity type could, com could have uh, come from uh, the substrate which was N-type. Uh, so in order to address uh, the challenges with the um, first attempt which had to do with um, um, non-uniformity of the silicon coating, um, we, we did uh, a kinetic study of uh, the in-situ uh, magnesiothermic reduction on the silicon wafer and this table presents results of the in-situ in uh, of results of the kinetic study and it can be seen that um, temperatures uh, temperature, uh, it can be seen that um, mass ratio of magnesium to silicon uh, around 1 to 1, 1.5 to 1 and 2 to 1 at temperatures of 750 yielded uh, uniform silicon coatings and interestingly uh, at lower temperatures this also yielded uh, magnesium silicide, uh, uniform magnesium silicide coatings of course with uh, impurities of magnesium oxide and um, the surface of these powders of these uh, coatings can be seen from the images below. Okay, so yeah, there is a bit of an error here. So yeah, so uh, bulk silicon wafer surface typically has this mirror-like uh, surface and the textures, textured silicon surface uh, appeared like this with a coffee brown uh, surface and um, microstructural images confirmed. Um, in fact, uh, the FIPSEM images confirmed um, micro pores and also cavities within this uh, uh, nanostructured coating. And because um, it appeared or it looked just like uh, black silicon, uh, we explored the, the optical properties of. Uh, this coating and uh, we explored it for different silica precursors for the um, pristine diatom silica for roasted and also for the calcine but we also explored for silicon silica nanoballs which were obtained from colleagues to confirm the reproducibility of uh, the in situ um, magnesiothermic reduction reaction of silicon the, on silic silicon substrate and the optical property results here, the absorption uh, didn't um, change much uh, in the uh, visible range, but in, in the near infrared range, uh, it dropped quite a bit, uh, which is quite typical for even uh, black silicon. So compared with uh, existing uh, black silicon types, which have been uh, produced via chemical etching and uh, laser treatment, uh, it is obvious that um, using uh, eco-friendly and uh, simple approaches, we're able to uh, also improve the optical properties of silicon substrate, uh, substrate uh, dramatically. The last part uh, talks about uh, textured silicon surfaces uh, and uh, uh, amorphous carbon uh, bilayer nanocomposite. As mentioned before, uh, to uh, evaluate the reproducibility of uh, this technique, uh, we reduced two different uh, silica precursors uh, from diatomite, like that's diatom silica, and also from silica nanospheres. And uh, uh, the the two led to the two precursors led to nanostructured silicon surfaces, but uh, quite different morphologies, which could be attributed to uh, possibly the uh, fine powder from the um, uh, nanosilica uh, source. And upon, uh, upon pipetting the uh, tails and pan uh, precursors directly on the nanostructured surfaces and allowing to uh, dry and um, also uh, etching with H HF, uh, 
uh, we produced uh, porous uh, anti a porous amorphous carbon layer which uh, sat directly on top of uh, textured silicon with uh, surface and uh, also uh, this was confirmed through uh, FIPSEM images. Now the uh, XRD um, analysis confirmed the presence of both silicon and also uh, the amorphous carbon uh, coating uh, which forms the bilayer another composite and uh, Roman spectra as well confirms uh, these faces present on top of the silicon wafer. Uh, so uh, we further explore the optical properties and uh, the optical properties of uh, from uh, figure A we can see uh, the absorption uh, light absorption of uh, textured silicon uh, surfaces uh, compared with the crystalline silicon and we can see that uh, we see a dramatic increase, significant increase in the light absorption. Uh, so uh, the next, which is figure B, also I investigated uh, the ab light absorption of uh, crystalline silicon, this time with um, uh, amorphous carbon, different amorphous uh, carbon uh, formulations on top of it. Uh, we have uh, the uh, continuous amorphous carbon layer and also porous carbon layers and uh, the absorption in the optical range, optical range of the electromagnetic spectrum increased uh, dramatically. Uh, this was also seen in the case of uh, the textured silicon uh, surfaces from diatomite and also from uh, silicon nanoballs. Uh, but in, sorry, but at longer uh, wavelengths, um, the absorption of uh, silicon. Uh, drops uh, significantly and this is also same for in fact uh, textured or uh, black silicon surfaces because almost all the light goes through uh, silicon and so um, uh, this is uh, where the um, uh, carbon overcoating um, proved to improve uh, the absorption properties over a broad, uh, a broad range of uh, the magnet, uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And here we can see that um, for the, so in figure A, for the crystalline surfaces, even with um, the amorphous carbon uh, overcoating, um, absorption decreased significantly, but for the textured silicon surfaces uh, absorption was quite steady and uh, we can attribute, it, attribute this to the effect of both uh, the amorphous, uh, the porous amorphous carbon coating and also the uh, textured silicon uh, surfaces which comes to play, with, uh, both come to play to improve the optical properties. The same can be seen for uh, the textured silicon surfaces obtained from uh, silica spheres and a comparison of uh, all four surfaces here. So initial uh, analysis of the optical band gap energy also confirmed a slight increase in the optical band gap for the uh, textured silicon surfaces obtained from the um, uh, in-situ magnesiothermic reduction of silicon, of silica, sorry. So, in conclusion, uh, thermally induced phase uh, transformations caused significant uh, uh, changes in the powder characteristics, uh, such as the particle size, pore size, the surface area, and crystallite size, and also color changes. And uh, crystalline and amorphous silica precursors exhibited different onset and peak exothermic reduction temperatures. Uh, the crystalline silica precursors showed or offered a better nanoscale uh, morphologies for the synthesized silicon powders and the crystalline powders showed superior electrochemical performance as a result of better powder characteristics and the nano-sized uh, silicon nanodes prepared from calcined diatom derived silica showed superior electrochemical performance than bulk silicon and the silicon wafer surface modification optimized was optimized following preliminary kinetics study via in situ magnesiothermic uh, reduction of silica precursors, plus uh, these surfaces uh, had comparable microstructure and optical properties to black silicon. And uh, the textured silicon uh, surfaces present a suitable platform for 
uh, further surface functionalization for a range of other applications. And lastly, uh, the bilayer textured silicon nanocomposite showed superior optical properties uh, than just the textured surfaces. So thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for your presentation, which, we, which is well on time. And we may now start with the questions um, from the jury members. So first, I will ask our uh, online uh, jury members. Um, so Dr. Uh, Maria Candila. Yes, hello. Hello, good to see you. So, um, uh, have you got uh, questions that you would like to ask uh, the candidate today in, as part of his defense? Yes, well, first, I would like to congratulate uh, the candidate uh, and his uh, supervisors for the very nice work. Uh, the work was very complete uh, and the research was thorough and the results were very well supported by the uh, experiments and the data. And the thesis was very well written and it was a pleasure to read it. Uh, it was very clearly, all, all evidence was clearly stated, all conclusions were clearly drawn and it was a very good, very good scientific uh, uh, text. Uh, so I, would, I have two questions uh, about the presentation. Uh, one, um, uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the presentation in materials and methods, there was a graph uh, showing the method for producing silicon uh, nanoflakes or nanostructures uh, on silicon substrate. I don't know if we can uh, go to this slide. So, Patrick, could you please help? What slide number shall I? I, do, I don't see it on my screen changing. I keep seeing the title slide. So. Yes, I w I'm trying to reshare the, the presentation. So just, just a second. Uh, thank you. So Patrick. Uh, do you want to slide uh, reshare? Uh, uh, yeah, which, which slide do you think will I be think the problem? It's, it's Yeah, it's nine. nine. Okay, let me reshare that for, for the online attendees. Okay, okay. yes, thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, um, would this uh, method also work for the production of silicon nanostructures on any arbitrary substrate, or does the substrate have to be uh, silicon for some reason? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof, for your question. So we actually explored this for other substrates, and we realized that it was not feasible. And the reason it's not feasible is... Um, I think can be seen from uh, the reaction part proposed in, in B. Uh, the intermediate uh, magnesium silicide phase formation is critical for uh, improving um, the nanostructured silicon coating on top of the substrate. And so um, without the formation of this phase, uh, it, you produce silicon powder on top of any other substrate, but um, you are unable to uh, get silicon um, uh, the, the produced silicon um, bonding directly to the substrate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. Uh, and uh, my second question uh, and last one uh, is actually it was on slide 32. This time I know the number of the slide. Can we, uh, if we could go to slide uh, 32. Okay, yes. Uh, in uh, graph A at the top left uh, part, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for the uh, lower, for the longer wavelengths, 
the textured silicon starts becoming transparent earlier than crystalline silicon. Uh, yeah. So in the infrared uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, so I was wondering why is that? Why, why is it that? Maybe it's also counterintuitive a little bit because one would expect that texturing would increase the absorption uh, of light. And then do you have an idea why when you texture silicon, uh, it starts becoming transparent earlier uh, at lower wavelengths than crystalline silicon? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I think, yes, so it's, it's, it's true and uh, it's quite interesting why um, even for the textured silicon surface, we see um, like a faster decline in the absorption than for the crystalline surface. And this is also uh, the same case for black silicon. Uh, and I, I tried to understand that, um, but it's still um, like an area of uh, study which should be explored because it's not very clear why uh, we see such dramatic uh, decline in absorption for the textured surface uh, than for the uh, crystalline uh, uh, silicon surface. Okay. Uh, can I ask, uh, have, you, have you checked if there is a change in the composition, in the chemical composition of the textured materials? Maybe they contain some elements that uh, uh, the pristine uh, silicon material does not contain? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, there is um, some element of uh, magnesium, which is the main um, uh, impurity in uh, the textured silicon uh, surface. So you think some magnesium is incorporated in there? Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, these are all the questions I have. And congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions and uh, the discussion. Now I turn to uh, Professor Dong Liu. Hi. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, for inviting me as a jury member of uh, Mr. Agri's defense. Uh, pleasure to meet you online. Uh, congr uh, then, uh, congratulations on the academic chat uh, Mr. Agri and his supervisors made. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Agri just uh, gave us a good presentation. He introduced uh, his research mainly on the uh, MRR uh, synthesis of silicon nanomaterials and uh, thermally induced uh, phase transmo uh, transformations um, uh, mechanism in the silicon oxygen uh, system. He also explored uh, the application on energy conversion. He did, uh, did quite, quite, a, quite a good work uh, during his PhD study, published four papers as a first author and uh, contributed to several publications. So my, uh, my research focused on the surface and the interfacial engineering of nanomaterials for solo energy uh, conversion, uh, especially for uh, solo driven catalysis. So my question is, how about the surface states of the air synthesized silicon nanomaterials by the MRR route? Are there any surface uh, ox oxid uh, ox oxid layer or surface doping by uh, mag uh, mechanism? Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, could you please come again with a question? I didn't quite uh, catch it. So how about the surface states of the synthesized silicon nanomaterials by the MRR route? Is there any surface oxide uh, layer or surface doping by uh, mechanism? Okay, thank you very much. I think I got it now. Uh, so um, if I got your question right, um, I don't know if you're referring to the powders, the silicon uh, powders produced or the nanostructured uh, silicon coating. Uh, but in the case of uh, the powders, um, well, from um, XRD measurements, we see only silicon, but um, it won't be surprising if there are some oxides, like uh, uh, the native oxide of silicon, just on top of um, the 
formed silicon powder and uh, I could also say same for uh, the nanostructured silicon coating uh, because I think uh, the native oxides form quite uh, easily. Thank you. Uh, is there any doping by uh, mechanism? Uh, please come again. Doping. doping. Is there any doping by uh, mechanism? Uh, no, please. Oh. And how about the long term stability for the battery or so cell? Will okay, it so, be uh, uh, easily oxidized uh, in the air? Um, you mean for the silicon uh, based batteries? Battery, uh, or, uh, yeah, battery. Yeah, so I, I don't think they are. Hello, Prof. Hi. Uh, I, I, uh, I just don't hear your answer. I, I mean, so, the long term stability of the, of, uh, for the battery uh, using yeah, and all I, uh, silicon and, uh, materials. I, I still can't um, get the question uh, right. Stability, long term stability. Of the batteries, of, of the silicon based batteries. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think um, um, the long term, uh, the long term stability of these batteries is, um, well, it's, it's quite uh, good in my Have opinion. Have you tested it before? Uh, no, no, we, we didn't do that. We just did uh, just preliminary um, electrochemical measurements of uh, these uh, anodes. Yeah. I see. Mm. And uh, I also have a question about the optical uh, property. Uh, because the optical property and the charge transport are both important for solar cell applications. Uh, so the, uh, the sensor says uh, nanomaterials using your method can act uh, as a black silicon uh, for lab light trapping. So how about the conductivity of this material? Uh, so the conductivity of this um, um, silicon coating, right? Yeah. Um, we, we did not um, uh, explore the electrical properties of um, the uh, textured silicon coating. I think what we tried to understand was the conductivity type to know if it's N-type or, or P-type and we only explored the optical properties. But as far as the electrical properties are concerned, I think uh, that's what we intend to, to do in the, in the future. Okay. Oh, thank you and uh, congratulations again. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Donglu, for these discussions and questions. Um, now I turn to the um, jury members that are with us here at Skoltech. And um, so, please, Professor uh, Piotr uh, Prichochenko, you have questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I have questions. Uh, my first question is about the, uh, you said that uh, the metal thermic redu reduction reaction is low cost, yeah. low energy. Yeah. So I, my question is, do you count the, the cost of the metal? Because you have to reduce it from the oxide. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's a very <laughs> good point. And I, I, I didn't take into consideration that, but um, so can I, can I answer the question directly, uh, Prof? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't take into account uh, the extractive part of uh, the reductant. That's in this case, uh, magnesium used. Uh, I just took into account the cost of mag mag magnesium used and also the fact that um, uh, it, it, the setup used for the reduction is just uh, uh, an argon filled uh, electric furnace. Uh, which is quite simple, and simple means also well, uh, low cost. So that's what I considered, but not the extractive part. 
Thank you. Uh, second question is, um, uh, you, you have studied their electrodes uh, as anodes in yeah. lithium ion batteries, uh, but you didn't uh, tell us about the rate dependence. Did you study the rate dependence of the electron? Did you compare it? I, rate, I, rate, rate dependence. No, no, we didn't do that yet. Uh, I hope we, I think it's something we are considering to do. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another question is <coughs> about the, uh, uh, about the mineral which you used, uh, diet and derived silica. You got it from the same place, right? But did you study the different, a different source um, obtained from different sources from different de deposits because it can be different no so we 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 did not compare with different uh, deposits we because we, russia, russia, russia is a nice place but <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah um i think it will it will be interesting to compare different uh diatom uh, cultures or species and it's something we 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 commented in, in a uh, review. I mean, uh, even you know, you took it from Penza, right? I, I, read, I read it in your thesis. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, you you didn't go there. You don't know where, I, where, I, where I, from I, you took it, and is it different from the same city? I, I mean, from the same actually, deposit. Actually, uh, now we are reducing some powders we got from, I think, from because in Egypt they have uh, huge deposits of diatoms too. So, yeah. Uh, and the last question is. Um, Philosophical, since you are looking for the philosophy doctor degree, uh, can you open the conclusions? Number conclusion number three, you say that uh, you have better nanoscale morphology. Yeah. What is better? What is worse? Okay, so better nanoscale morphology for the silicon uh, produced silicon powder is um, um, morphology which is quite comparable to uh, the precursor. So we want to maintain. Uh, I, I don't know if I can take you. Back to um, I think it's um, slide the first slide about um, materials processing. Just to answer your question, uh, it's, it should be slide six or five. Okay. No eight. Thank you. Yeah, so a better nanoscale morphology is one that has uh, some features from the precursor diatomite powder. And as we can see here, okay. And as we can see here, uh, this is the same morphology of uh, nanosilicon powder we obtained. It has some uh, nanoporous uh, details from the precursor powder. So that's what we mean by better nanoscale uh, morphology. Because if we produce, yes, we, we obtain silicon, but uh, we destroy the nanoscale morphology from the precursor, then we, we might as well use uh, other means to just produce silicon. Thank you. Thank you, too. Prof. So thank you very much. Um, then now, uh, Mitri Aksionov, your colleague, can you, you have questions? Yep. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So uh, the first question I have regarding the electrochemical properties, okay. right? Mm, so on your plot, you show that the specific capacity is increasing with cycles. Yep. So why it is so? Um, so just a moment. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof, for your question. Uh, we see uh, an increase in the specific capacity for the silica anodes uh, because uh, of the lithiation mechanism in silica-based anodes. So uh, from literature, when silica reacts with lithium, um, it produces um, irreversible, it acts as um, a convertible oxide, which leads to uh, irreversible uh, phases like uh, lithium oxide, lithium silicate, and uh, electroactive silicon domains. So it is these uh, silicon domains that uh, react further with the lithium to uh, increase the capacity. And that's what we see for the silica-based anodes. Okay. 
Uh, so, but uh, you also provide the columbic efficiency for yeah. these cycles. Yeah. If you have an increase of specific capacity, does it mean that your columbic efficiency should be more than 100%? Yes. So, um, I think uh, what we did was, I think um, um, when I was calculating the columbic efficiencies uh, at all times, the charge capacity was lower than the discharge capacity. We see an increase in the um, uh, charge capacity, but it's always lower than the discharge capacity. Okay. So then uh, why the calcinite samples show the highest capacity um, uh, compared to pristine and roasted? Um, I think um, from um, our initial uh, analysis and discussions, it's uh, likely due to the different powder characteristics amongst uh, the three uh, silica anodes we used. Uh, the calcine powder shows somewhat uh, better uh, powder characteristics and also um, I thought about it uh, because um, the reaction uh, between silica and lithium leads to uh, lithium oxide and lithium silicates and silicon, which is very key, electroactive silicon, which is very key for the improved, uh, for increasing um, the capacity. Uh, we see quite, um, we see quite a similar trend for the magnesiothermic reduction where the crystalline powders um, have lower, in terms of the magnesiothermic, they have much lower onset reduction reactions that silicon is formed earlier in the crystalline powders from the results we got from the thermal analysis. So it's possible, my hypothesis, it's possible that in the case of the calcined and roasted, which are both crystalline silica powders, we form silicon much uh, earlier and possibly uh, we have more more silicon domains, electroactive silicon domains in the crystalline powders, but it's something to explore further. Okay, so the next question would be, so you propose this silica as a promising and not material, right? But for yes, not material in order to operate, mm -hmm. you also need to conduct electrons yeah. to support the yeah. redox reaction, right? Yeah. But it's known that silica is like good insulated. Yeah. So how are you going to use it as an art material? Uh, so yeah, I think we need a uh, very good uh, carbon coating and it's exactly what we're doing now. What we tested here is just um, uh, just uncoated silica in its uh, natural form. Uh, but um, measurements we're doing now um, have silicon powders which have been coated with, uh, pre-coated with pan and then uh, prepared as electrode. So uh, to implement it as an anode material, it requires proper carbon coating. Okay, thank you. Can you go to conclusions? So, the first conclusion, thermally induced transformation causes significant changes in silica powder characteristics such as particle size, pore size, surface area, crystallization. So, can you characterize uh, shortly, so what happens with particle size, pore size, surface area? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, after thermally induced phase transformations, we see uh, huge color changes for mm -hmm. the roasted and for the calcine powders. Uh, we also see, um, because we crystallize the powders, uh, we obtain uh, main phase crystobalite and we see that for the calcine powders, we have a smaller crystallite crystal, uh, crystal size and uh, much bigger crystallite crystal size for the roasted powders. Uh, we see um, a drop in the surface area for the heat treated powders and also uh, for the pore size we see an increase because uh, during um, thermally induced uh, phase transformations or just thermal treatment of diatomite uh, or diatom silica uh, impurities that block 
pores are decomposed. And uh, lastly, the particle size uh, increases slightly. Okay, thank you. thank you. And the last question would be regarding the last point in your conclusions, right? Regarding the superior optical properties of nanocomposites. So what does it mean superior? In, can you elaborate on that? So uh, superior 0.9, right? Hmm? 0.9. Okay, thank you. Uh, so superior in the terms that, in uh, in the sense that we have um, improved optical absorption, light absorption over a broad range of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, for the bilayer textured silicon and amorphous carbon composites uh, compared with just textured silicon. Because for textured silicon, we have good absorption in the optical range. Uh, sorry, in the uh, yeah, in the visible range, but this drops uh, in uh, at high, uh, longer wavelengths, uh, so that's what we we mean in uh, point nine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we turn to our jury member, uh, Sakilaris uh, Mailis, please, Professor. Thank you very much. Microphone, please. Um, yeah, I'd like to congratulate you for the very high quality uh, work that you have produced. Thank you. Uh, and um, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> um, so, uh, firstly, I, I was intrigued by the, this term that uh, um, you use in your thesis, that, that the, the uh, precursor for the diatoms is food grade. Yeah. So what does that mean? Is, is it the food stuff? Or <laughs> yeah, it's, so what I know, it's uh, like a food supplement. Uh, is it? Yeah. No. And that is a follow-up question is, do you know what is the pretreatment that this substance takes mm -hmm. uh, in order to arrive uh, to you as a precursor? Is, is there some purification process? And is this, uh, for example, mm -hmm. um, uh, costly in terms of energy? Uh, is it chemi chemical process? What is it? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, from the label, if I remember correctly, I think the first powder I worked with um, uh, stated that the powders were heat treated at 900, the first powders I worked with. But the, the powders I worked with here uh, did not undergo any um, high temperature treatments, but typically diatom uh, silica powders are dried uh, in oven to remove uh, moisture. So that's not expensive and uh, it's not energy intensive, uh, but I mean, from uh, the side of um, the producers, um, they did not do any purification, but you can purify diatom silica with uh, uh, some acids. So there's no refinement, it's, uh, it's the same as you get it from... Exactly. The uh, okay, um, there's another question I have. Um, um, does this powder um, show any fluorescence? The reason why I'm asking mm -hmm. you is because I, I noticed that in your Raman uh, uh, spectrum that you produced from mm -hmm. this uh, substance, you had a, a very high signal mm -hmm. on the um, higher wave numbers, mm -hmm. while for, for pure silica, I would expect you to have a large signal mm -hmm. on the lower wave numbers mm -hmm. on the left side, let's say, of the uh, uh, silicon peak. Could it, this be due to fluorescence? E, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think um, diatom frustals in general are known to show some uh, fluorescence, and I think um, I have colleagues who worked on uh, this particular uh, topic or in line with this particular topic. And so, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, uh, diatom frustals uh, show a bit of uh, fluorescence. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, uh, I have a, a final question. Um, so, you produce these uh, composites of carbon and uh, silicon, right? Um, silicon. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the purpose of that was to uh, increase the absorption. Yes. Uh, what would be the application? Why, why do you want high absorption? So, yeah, we, we want high absorption for optical devices that 
harness uh, energy from the sun. If you're able to increase absorption, then it means uh, all the uh, photons arriving on the surface are absorbed and used up. And so you improve, uh, you increase the efficiency of the, of the optical device, such as a photo detector, or even uh, in, the, in, in uh, a more conventional case, uh, a silicon-based uh, solar cell. Yeah, this is, this is what I thought. I thought that you want to, to use it for energy harvesting. Mm -hmm. But the, the question is the following, uh, is that uh, the, the absorption is only, only part of the, um, the question. Uh, what's important is that you, you need to harvest the uh, photons, mm -hmm. but then to transfer them into charge. Yes. So how do you know that uh, you actually create photocarriers and not uh, just uh, some heat in, in the carbon? Do you yeah. have any evidence that you uh, have cu cu currently, currently, no evidence like that, but uh, I think it's um, a follow-up um, uh, task of uh, what we've done so far. We, we hope to explore that further. So what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think first of all measure the electrical properties. We need to know the electrical properties of uh, the textured silicon surface and it will be interesting to have this uh, textured silicon surface on top of uh, uh, an already existing PN junction to, to know that um, the absorption, we, the increase in absorption we, we see also correlates with increased um, uh, light, uh, light electricity conversion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you too, Prof. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I have some comments and questions myself. <clears throat> so please, can you go back first for a short comment to slide 20? Yes, just a comment. When you write columbic efficiency, it shouldn't be columbic, but columbic. Okay. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Prof. Charles Auguste Coulomb was a French uh, scientist, <laughs> okay. and he's not related to Christopher Columbus. Okay. Okay, 300 <laughs> years right. before his Thank time. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, now, um, you see, when I was reading your thesis, I was more focused, let's say, on the, um, on the uh, let's say, scientific and technical aspects. But uh, something that was, um, say, coming back regularly in your presentation now was about, let's say, um, the cost, high cost, low cost, long, short-term treatment, eco-friendly, um, and, uh, let's say, energy efficiency in the treatment, okay? Uh, so for this presentation, if you speak about that, I would expect some uh, numbers, some benchmark, because when you say eco-friendly techniques, what does that mean and on which scale it is eco-friendly? When you are in the lab, you basically produce some samples and you use some particular technique to which extent this in the lab is eco-friendly, and if you scale this up, imagine you have a factory or something, how do you scale this eco-friendly character? I mean, how do you characterize eco-friendly? What are the numbers that can tell you that you are eco-friendly, you're not eco-friendly? That's uh, one question. Do you have, let's say, some um, remarks about that? Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, so, uh, well, I think um, our understanding or our um, uh, comment on uh, eco-friendliness of uh, our approach is in terms of uh, the fact that uh, we, we use, um, uh, well, uh, in the case of our precursors, we use uh, magnesium, uh, silica, uh, and uh, from the early slides, uh, we know that silica in itself is eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's abundant, it's low cost, uh, so that bit of it already scores a point on uh, cost and e eco-friendliness. Uh, with regards to magnesium, um, it's, uh, it's also cheap, uh, 
not talking about the extractive part of it. Uh, it's cheap and, uh, to the best of my knowledge, also eco-friendly. Yes, uh, excuse me, cheap in this context. What does that mean? In the sense that, if you tell me, if you tell me that mm -hmm. uh, ten dollars per kilogram is cheap, mm -hmm. I'm happy to believe you. If you tell me one thousand dollars per kilogram is cheap, I'm happy to I mean, to believe you. So, um, yeah. what is yeah. cheap? Yeah. So. Um, um, Unfortunately, I, I do not have the numbers to, to back uh, this claim. Uh, but when compared to uh, other techniques, um, what we can see is um, the straightforward approach mixing magnesium and silica powders to form silicon or having it directly on top of a wafer to nanostructure it. This straightforward approach gives um, some slight idea that it's it's cheap, not in terms of number, but because it's straightforward and fast, it, it's cheap. And um, uh, also the fact that we don't, we don't use um, uh, dangerous chemicals like uh, hexo um, SF6 and um, a lot of HF means that it's somewhat uh, eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. So that's what we mean. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have numbers to back the claim, but um, the facile nature and the fact that we we don't use a lot of uh, dangerous chemicals in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point is here is that uh, again, for me, your thesis from the technical viewpoint, scientific viewpoint, is perfectly fine. And again, thank you for your presentation. Okay. Uh, you've been doing, a, let's say, you have done a lot of work for characterization and uh, explanation of uh, all the let's say technical steps. Uh, but again, in your presentation, it's extremely important that you look at the techno-economic aspects mm -hmm. and the ecological aspects if you, let's say, mention these. If you want to, uh, let's say, show the importance of your work, not mm -hmm. only from the scientific and technical viewpoint, but also in terms of, um, let's say, added value mm -hmm. for the treatment, the processing, and you say, okay, this is eco-friendly, you have to back this up with numbers. Yeah. If everything goes fine, you'll be a doctor soon. So you need to to be careful with this sort of uh, of uh, aspects of your presentation. All right. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, on slide eight. Um, Yes. So you have this uh, chart there with the arrows. Yeah. So um, you see, you, you say, for instance, uh, pristine and heat treated uh, silica precursors reduced for six hours. Okay. Yeah. Um, the heat treatment for diatom silica powder at 1100 degrees C, uh, how long? Oh, ah, yeah. Sorry. That was for four hours. Four hours, yeah. okay. So you need a minimum of four hours, mm -hmm. or I mean, four hours is it the optimal time, or could you do that at let's say higher temperature with um, let's say less time? I mean, how do you optimize, let's say the the heat mm -hmm. that you want and hence the temperature that you have in your oven mm -hmm. um, with time? So um, four hours. We choose four hours because um, we did not want to even though we wanted to induce phase transformation, we did not want to do that at the expense of uh, morphology because mm -hmm. we want to induce phase transformation but maintain morphology. If you increase, and this temperature because of this reason, if you increase temperature and you increase uh, the time, um, the probability of destroying the morphology increases. So that's why we, we, we used 1,100 for four hours. Okay, okay. And some uh, small, uh, let's say, physics question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, Raman spectroscopy. Yeah. Uh, do you have a clear idea of what this, uh, let's say, spectroscopy approach uh, entails? What do you measure? 
So we measure the vibrations uh, between, uh, I think, um, in the case of uh, silicon and ox uh, silica, it's uh, silicon and oxygen. And in the case of uh, just silicon, silicon and silicon mm -hmm. bonds. So the vibration levels, yes, yeah. of the molecule. And um, does that involve elastic or inelastic scattering? So uh, it involves, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, inelastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, what inelastic means here? Uh, it means that uh, not all the energy from uh, the photon is absorbed. Some is also uh, scattered. So energy is not conserved yeah. in the process. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Prof. Uh, welcome. So now, um, formally, um, can we come back to the uh, Zoom, please? Good. So um, now I have to ask uh, formally each jury member to confirm whether or not they are satisfied with the changes uh, made to the thesis after review. So I will first start with our colleague, Dr. Maria Candila. Simply state if you are satisfied or not with the changes made uh, after the, uh, your review. Uh, yes, I'm satisfied with the changes. They were all successfully addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Professor Dong Liu, are you satisfied with the changes made uh, to the thesis after your review? Uh, yes. Mm, I agree. Uh, the, the, the revision uh, can all uh, answer my uh, question. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Plihochenko, are you satisfied? Yes, I am satisfied completely. All my comments have been adequately addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Aksionov, yes, are you I'm... satisfied? Yes, I am satisfied. Professor Mailis, are you satisfied with the changes? Yes, I'm happy with the changes. Right. And I'm uh, satisfied too with the changes uh, made to the thesis. So thank you very much. Now, uh, we have uh, some guests online, and I would like to ask them first if they would like to ask um, questions for scientific and technical questions to our PhD uh, candidate today. And if so, please present yourself. So I see that uh, Arianit Reka uh, wishes to ask a question. So please briefly present yourself and then ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, warm greetings to everyone from North Macedonia. Uh, I actually don't have a question. I'd just like to congratulate uh, my friend Patrick Agray for his excellent presentation. I would like to thank the jury members for your constructiveness. I'm associate professor of the chemistry department here at Tetova, North Macedonia. And uh, at last but not least, I'd like to thank the, uh, the supervisor, Professor Alexander Korsunski, for his uh, great uh, supervision of the candidate. Uh, this is all I have to say. I don't have any question. It was a privilege to be part of this um, a presentation. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much for your comments. So if online we do not have uh, more comments or questions, I will ask offline. So we have guests in this room. So anyone has questions or remarks to make? No? Right. Okay. So uh, then I will turn to the famous words of the uh, supervisors. So, dear Alexei, please the mic. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure to work with uh, Patrick. So I would state that uh, right now we have Patrick, uh, former Mr. President, doctor, I hope, very soon. Uh, that he is self-motivated, self-organized, and fully ready scientist uh, of a high-ranked qualification. So this is the general, and of course, uh, many uh, 
new questions appeared after the finishing of these studies, so they should be addressed, and I hope that Patrick will supervise somebody else uh, in this direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Korsunski. Thank you, Annie. So, um, I think um, one aspect of um, research uh, towards PhD is that it's a journey. And uh, we have here in front of us a candidate, and I still remember when Patrick started on this journey, um, he uh, knew perhaps a little less, but he brought with him some very important qualities. He is a very clear thinker. He articulates his thoughts very well, and we've seen it when he wrote papers in the course of this project, and including such difficult uh, types as review papers, where it's important to balance uh, existing knowledge, to add to it the insights that he acquired during his research and so on, and Patrick has done it extremely well. And um, I think um, uh, he's also quite a modest person, uh, uh, and, and, and if you uh, imagine um, I, I feel today what was lacking was that the diatom uh, algae that uh, uh, is the precursor of this uh, diatomaceous earth uh, silica that Patrick has used are beautiful natural creatures with intricate nanoscale structure. And uh, I think from my experience, which I would have used in place of Patrick, I would have dazzled everyone with those images before going on. Uh, uh, Cycularis, I know, works on nanostructuring of uh, photonic materials and so on, and nature does it effortlessly in huge quantity, in huge variety. And um, um, uh, I may just put a plug to a paper that we recently published in 2023 in scientific reports on the nanoscale structure of diatomalgae. But in Patrick's project, he effectively piggybacked on what nature does so well and showed what can be done. And I think uh, as a type of project, as a kind of approach, it's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, in the course of this work, we generally had the opportunity to think about uh, diatom fustules as a, a platform for nanostructured, nanotechnological applications. And uh, Patrick has done an excellent job covering an important aspect of this general movement. I think you're a wonderful man, Patrick. You've done well. It's been a pleasure supervising you upwards and onwards to new achievements. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much for these words from both supervisors. So now it's time for uh, the closed deliberation. So I will ask everyone except the jury members to uh, leave the room. And uh, online, um, Yelena, I think our two jury members moved to breakout room. Yes, exactly. Yes. I will create it right now. Patrick, where are you going? So, Patrick. So, I will uh, tell you the uh, decision of the uh, your PhD jury. Okay. So, we decide, decided to award you uh, your PhD degree unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And your pass is thesis is accepted as is. Thank so you very much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. I have a few words now to. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank God for this day, and uh, my first uh, appreciation goes to my scientific uh, and uh, co-supervisors, and. Uh, Big thanks to the jury chair and members for accepting uh, my request and for playing this role 
Excellently. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to colleagues and friends. Thank you to my, my wife, who is not here. She's in Russia now, but uh, she's not here at the moment. And thank you to colleagues uh, from CES who have been uh, very helpful. I can't mention name, names. There are a lot of them. So thank you very much. And uh, God bless you all for your time thank and you. support. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. <laughs>